All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Conversations in Agave Masterclass with Alex Jandranoa um, with Bonez Mascal. Um, I'm really pleased about this talk because it we're going to talk about agaves and climate change and not in the direction that you think we're going to be talking about them. Um, <laughs> we've decided that in the midst of all of this terrible news that we live with every single day, um, we wanted to turn things around a little bit. And Alex had the great idea of just like, there's so many positive things to talk about when it comes to agaves and climate and just different ways in which we can look at them. Um, so I ha had a chance last year on the Dia del Mascalero trip with Bonnez to, to bond with Alex. Um, and then continue the conversation since then. So it is with my great pleasure that I introduce you to Alex Jandranoa. So take it from here, Alex. Hi guys, thank you, Susan. That was a wonderful <laughs> intro. Uh, yeah, um, again, I'm Alex, I'm with Bonhez, uh, and Susan definitely hit the nail on the head. Um, talking about climate change and sustainability and these things, it's, it's a lot of times daunting. Um, that's what I, I, I studied a lot of food systems and environmental studies was like my focus in college. And yeah, every class was really depressing. <laughs> um, it's one of those things that you kind of get yourself to. But what I found really interesting is that in getting into food and then especially into mezcal and agaves, uh, every time there was something really negative, we would look at agave and find something new about it that, uh, that kind of just overshadowed it. So I guess I kind of want to start with talking about the agave as a plant and, and kind of why it is one of these things that gets brought up in sustainability all the time. Um, first, it's a succulent, right? Those little guys we plant in our trees pretty easily in like our gardens or have in pots. It's pretty easy to think about those, but there's over 200 of them and they grow from the farthest reaches of the U.S. Like if you're in Portland, you probably see some of these in, in yards, some different versions of agaves. You guys on Instagram uh, post agave in the wild or what is it? Uh, agave Agaves among amongst us. us. <laughs> yes. Um, and it, it's something that is really fun because you start to realize how many there are. And what's something that I find really interesting is that Mezco has created this very nerdy society that you obviously understand very well. Um, and Agaves don't just make mezcal. In fact, the, the minority of agaves are used to make mezcal. Uh, agaves find there's over 200 species throughout the world. Um, and particularly what I find really interesting is that, yes, they're used to make beverages, pulque, um, mezcal, bacanora, tequila, all these kind of things. Hold on, I'm gonna pause. My rabbit is very mad that it's dinner time. <laughs> One second, guys. Um, I think that it's so perfect that we are interrupted by Alex's rabbit um, and it comes at this timely convert you know point in the conversation so Alex has an angry rambunctious rabbit yes she's almost of 90 course. in rabbit years <laughs> so uh, I definitely let her do what she wants <laughs> but essentially these agaves not to get back into it they've been used for mezcal for a long time but we also see them used as fibers we see them used as building materials the food source that helped build mesoamerica to what it was um and even now kind of in modern senses we use it used in medicines it's sometimes in like steroids and things like that and it's because these plants for all of their variety have some really cool characteristics that are going to benefit us as climate change kind of comes along um and so to think about climate change we have to remember that a lot of our places that we can grow food are going away or changing rapidly into things that are more arid, uh, less rainfall, it's becoming drier and hotter or ra so rainy that you can't grow things. It's kind of changing and flipping things. But a lot of what we see is places that we can't grow crops where we used to be able to. Um, and agaves are amazing in the fact that they don't give a shit. <laughs> um, they're actually part of what, about 7% of plants um, that are referred to as Crocillian acid metabolites, um, metabolisms, or let's call them CAMs. Essentially, there are the, these type of plants that are specifically designed to grow in these arid desert regions. Uh, the big thing about these plants is most of them aren't able to be used by humans. Uh, we can kind of graze on them, but they're more about just kind of being there in the environmental earth. They help us as humans, but they're not part of our traditional workings. Um, agaves, on the other hand, are. They have a really, really long history. Um, but outside of having this long history, they have a really cool impact on the planet. Um, partially because they are part of this really small 7% of plants, 
but partially because they have this history of being used as well. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about both of those. Um, the 7% of CAMs as we call them, uh, what is really special about them is their water retention. Um, and so what they do is they don't use much water at all and they grow and many times they grow with a large biomass. So something that has a lot of sugar in it. Uh, and the way they do this is they've adapted to being in the desert. Uh, and so what happens is rather than absorbing water during the day um, when it's sunny out and things like that, um, they have plants or agaves actually open, open their stomata, which are those little tiny pores within the leaves at night. And so what they do is they actually absorb carbon at night, at night rather than the day. So they don't lose any water in this process. They're not putting water out into the atmosphere. They're actually holding on to it. And so at the end of the night, unlike most plants, they actually have a net positive carbon intake. So they're taking in more, car more carbon. Uh, and then during the day, what's really cool is they're actually processing those, that carbon in two ways. Yes, through photosynthesis and the light that's breaking down the carbon, but also internally through a biosynthesis where they're actually breaking down that carbon and storing it in the sugars. And if we, we think about agaves, they have tons and tons of sugars. That's what makes them great about mezcal. But that same facet that makes them great for mezcal makes them great for bringing down the levels of carbon in our atmosphere. Um, and so that's something that I find really, really fascinating about these agaves is that they do this process so efficiently and so well. Um, it actually makes them really big potential uh, uh, plants for the future of biofuels. Um, you know, that's just one kind of microcosm of where we can look into it. But when you kind of start reading through the text, you start to realize that these plants all this, do all this great stuff for the, the climate just on their own. You know, this is just an agave left in the wild, not planted in anybody's field, just in the middle of the woods. It's doing all this great stuff for its environment around it, the humans, the, an the plant animals, the plants around it. It's bringing in more carbon. Um, but what's really cool is that there's over a hundred different products you can make from agaves in general. Um, and so, what I really want to kind of focus on is like, we have these ideas of mezcal and agave is being used for that, but if we take mezcal out of it, right? And we just look at the agave as this wonderful plant and how it's being used, uh, it goes beyond, uh, um, it goes beyond just kind of planting them um, for mezcal, right? These aren't just planted for mezcal, they're used to grow other crops. And this is a huge key facet for me. Um, and so when they're used to grow other crops, that means that the people that are growing them are taking into account their effect on the rest of the environment. Um, and so these agaves are planted many times as kind of fence lines, right? That's what we traditionally hear about it. But what I think is really cool is the way that they're treated as fences. So if we look at a parcel of land owned by a community, um, many times, if you just look at the overhead, it just looks like a bunch of squares, right? It looks kind of, I'm going to draw it out, just kind of like, hey, great, right? Like something like that. But when we start to look at it in a topographical way, you realize that these parcels of land are actually sitting on a bunch of hills that are all going different directions. And so these agaves actually allow farmers and specifically small family farmers that are growing these agaves to parcel out their land and effectively kind of mitigate different things such as soil erosion, water reclamation, um, making sure that your plants are mixed. All these different things can be done by creating borderlines with your agave because it's not flat. It's not Illinois, right? I'm, I'm in Chicago right now. If we go out, you can lay everything in a perfect square by square by square by square grid. Um, but in Oaxaca, that's not possible. From one hill to the next on some a communal plot of land, the, ter the soil can be different, the slope, the terrain, the types of rocks are there. But what's cool is by using agave, you actually can mitigate these effects and kind of parcel out your land in a way that it allows you to kind of use the land to its best efficiency. And then in a unique way, because these plants are so good at this, kind of living with other plants and surviving next to other plants, they actually increase your overall um, growth, right? More plants, less work, which is a huge thing. And you actually are able to 
harvest your fences. You're able to harvest these things that traditionally wouldn't be. And so by kind of using agaves um, throughout land and using it in traditional farming, they're increasing the biodiversity within their farms. So this does a few things. Um, like we said, it kind of increases crops. And the way it does that is that pests, if there's a lot of diversity in a field, they don't want to come in there. And also because this has been being done for so long in this way, the seeds and genetics are actually protected from the way they grow and in the communal sense of growing from these pests. And so it works to both grow more vegetables and fruit. And because you're using no less pesticides, less fertilizers, it lowers your input cost as a farmer and raises the price and value of your crops in a way that it doesn't quite do it. Um, the other thing about these agaves is by using them as a natural fences and kind of using these agaves, you're increasing the amount of wildlife in your fields. And that goes beyond the types of plants. You're encouraging animals to come in there that are pollinators, right? You're getting these bats, you're getting um, insect eater bats, which are great, pollen eater bats, which are great. You're also increasing hawks and you're increasing the amount of mice and rabbits um, and different things in these fields. And so when you can have a more natural aspect to your fields of predator prey mentality and also vegetation that these, these animals use, you actually increase um, not only the production of your land overall of uh, kind of crops, and by overall, I mean not just in the short term, right? Not throwing a bunch of crops and growing it, but like for generations. You have plants that fight against disease, that grow continuously, that produce seeds for generations. And so you're not just having one big input, you're actually looking at how this land works in the long term. Um, but also because these agaves take so long to mature, they allow animals to create natural habitats within your fields. They allow your, the animals to understand the more the natural cycles of how things are working as a farmer kind of tends their land in a region that is very much not covered by other fields, right? The mountain goes up and you have woods that you can't grow anything in and these animals live up there. Uh, whereas kind of the agriculture we see here in the U.S. is not that way. We're trying to get rid of all those animals. We're trying to take away as many, we're, we're getting rid of forests and planting more fields. And so it's kind of interesting because agaves um, in such a traditional sense are a lot like how we see small farmers in, throughout the U.S. Uh, before we kind of impacted and created monocultures and all these things, uh, small family farmers were actually benefiting the communities around them, right? By growing by diverse vegetables and things they're in tilling their soil and leaving these different things, they were actually upping the amount of, I guess, value, both economically and sustainably, the land held. Um, and it's really, really interesting kind of looking at how these agaves can be used in their cycle. Um, and it's really fun to think about that. These agaves have been farmed and used in this method for over 7,000 years minimum. Yeah. I, I mean, it really is, you know, um, when you start thinking about the power that they bring of, you know, not having to let the fields sit fallow um, because of just that constant, you know, uh, that they're there for as long as they are, they're bringing in the carbon, the carbon sequestration that's happening, that the soil retains, you know, uh, uh, the number of nutrients that it does. And when you're you're matching that with planting the diverse crops. Um, it really is kind of the powerhouse of, of truly sustainable farming methods. Um, but And it does make them more of a powerhouse, which I think is really unique. Um, so there's a pretty cool kind of research study looking at Guerrero, uh, which has a replanting kind of quality to it, right? Where through subsidies of the government, the individuals in Guerrero, there's nine national nurseries I believe that can be, that are then meant to go and reforest the population, uh, which is really cool. And through this, they've been able to get better ideas about how agave, agaves affect traditional farming methods, the communities that they grow in, uh, versus when you industrialize it, right? When you take this amazing crop and you grow it up. And so we can see that in Jalisco specifically, when the traditional growing methods of agave were expanded, yes, there was a lot more money coming from that land. But what's interesting to see is that that money didn't stick with the community. 
Um, and so it's traditionally these big, large things. Yes, they've increased the amount of money coming from the land and from the agaves in it by monocropping these, making these giant fields that all look the same and kind of discarding traditional growing methods. Uh, and it's kind of a positive outlook to look at is if you think about how much carbon those fields are sucking up, that's one way I can kind of swill, swallow what's a really hard pill. Because when we look deeper into how this worked and how it actually separated families, it's really devastating. Um, these monocultures took away any of the profits that these small rural farmers would have. And this study was done back in 2007, before a big mezcal, a lot of the big kind of mezcal booms and things like that. But what's interesting is even though one hectare of a monocultured blue agave Weber field will bring in double the amount of money, it actually halves the amount of money that the community members receive and it halves the amount of people that receive that money. So even though it increases the amount of money, the traditional farming of agaves in the way that we had kind of described actually brings in more economic power to the communities and it spreads that economic wealth to more communities. Um, and what's really interesting about that is the fact that um, most of the communities in Mezcal that we drink are still farming as they have many, many years ago. Um, and this type of farming actually allow, with the farming that includes agaves in your sustenance, right? So you're growing frijol, you're growing um, corn, maize, you're growing uh, calabaza, so squash, corn, beans. And in fact, what's cool, we call it, this is the milpa system, all right? Um, we all, I, I hope we're all familiar with this. The three sisters, if your elementary school isn't teaching about the three sisters, it's pretty bad. Um, but the three sisters in the milpa are cousins, you know, just to think about it that way. But it's, it gets even more in depth is that they're growing these corns, but when we take a closer look, we realize that it's not just corn, it's eight varietals of heritage corn with beautiful seeds. It's four varietals of squash. It's five varietals of beans. It's chili peppers, it's wild herbs. It's all these kind of things that along with growing these alongside the agave, um, the agave are helping them, right? Because they don't take on much water. If you harvest them, their leaves, their pankas are left in the ground um, to recycle and create bio, um, they're creating biomass and a lot of organic matter to help grow these things. Um, but then on the other flip side, all these one year crops are helping the agaves grow, right? So it's this very secular manner that we've talked about a lot with in, in uh, the, same, the sense of like mezcal is communal and it is secular, but it goes beyond these, right? This type of farming with agaves is secular. It's kind of methodical in the way that it's meant to enrich one plant as it helps the other. As you harvest another, you're enriching this. And, and it really leaves the idea that mezcal is not the catalyst for agave growth. It's an adaptation from a traditional agave growing methods. Um, and so these traditional growing agave methods not only help your plants and help your soil, but they're adaptable, right? So right now is a perfect example. Uh, the fact that we can't sell as much, like as brands, like we aren't selling as nearly as much mezcal as we wish we were, right? We're not able on a financial sense to support the communities in as much of a way as we wish we could, right? When we were able to sell as much as we can. I think this goes across all the brands, all the panels you've had. We all wish that we could sell more and help more. But what's cool is that if your brand is using this type of traditional growth methods, the maestros can adapt, right? Rather than like planting more agaves and things like this, they can move their systems, their parcels of lands, if they're rotating and doing this in the way that is traditionally being done, they can adapt and overcome these kind of gluts and falls. Not fully as we all, no one can, right? Like I'm pretty sure we're all hurting right now, um, but it can help mitigate it. So we don't see something like the giant overages of agave where we saw in Alisco where the farmers were completely screwed. Um, or the shortages where like the people tried to sell them a scout, they couldn't afford to do it. And so traditional farming methods in agave help mitigate the price. They create a natural price floor and price ceiling in a healthier way because they help the farmer uh, rotate through. And it's something that's been done for a very long time is this rotational crop. And even in the 60s and 70s, when mezcal was popular, and especially in the mining, like back, back in the 1800s, we see a huge boom in mezcal for mining. But mines aren't always producing the mineral they want. Mines move, right? And so the communities adapted to the fact that the mines move. 
And so their parcels of land rotated, right? So that they knew that it was going to be a heavy year with miners, they would have planted more agaves, right, for the next couple seasons to move forward. Um, and this is just, it's something that's really interesting is that traditional agave farming is absolutely the best. Sometimes, you know, like people are like, oh, you can't teach an old dog's new tricks. Well, that's fine. You don't need to at this point. Uh, what we really need to focus on is understanding the complexity of this farming method, the complexity of agaves in terms of like how they're actually impacting the, the flora and fauna around them. It's something that's really not studied to a full extent yet as other plants have been. Well, I mean, I, I, one of the main reasons that I got into mescal was from studying corn and going to Oaxaca to try and understand the cultivation of heirloom corn varieties, et cetera. And to see that the symbiotic relationship that corn and agave have is a very interesting thing. And as over, you know, with the increasing demand happening, with mescal and the fields that are being planted with agave. Like anytime I see just fields of agave, there's like a little part of my heart breaks um, because I'm not seeing a mix of crops. And I feel like there's an opportunity um, for, for the development and resuscitation of heirloom corn varieties, um, that there can be partnerships with you know brands or with the government, et cetera, to encourage the growth of these heirloom varieties within the rows of agave, you know, that, that benefit everybody um, and give this great food resource uh, for, for people as, as the heirloom varieties of corn have given way to, ironically, corn that's being imported from the United States that doesn't have the same levels of nutrients um, that people need in their tortillas and tamales, et cetera there and there might you know the process maize i mean it's a it's a really i think corn is one of those really interesting crops because it, it, it in one way it's a prime example of what happens when genetics are taken over and ipo ipo rights are attached to genetics specifically in the food system it's one of the things that i love the difficulty we have kind of breaking down what agaves are genetically because it makes it really hard to put a patent on their genetics. Um, in fact, agave, the, the really the, the only way you're going to produce and kind of manipulate genetics is through breeding, which takes minimum seven years. And the best people who uh, at breeding these agaves, um, unlike the best people at breeding corn, are actually small um, agrarian communities. They've been doing it for so long. Um, in fact, when we've applied modern methods, so one modern method to change genetics, you might know this through corn, but is to literally blast infrasonic rays into the amoebic state of the plant. So if you're going to cut an agave, bisect an agave in half, traditionally what will happen is it'll grow the other half of it, right? And that's how we get a lot of these clones is we bisect, 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 all these until we have a field of these. But another way that you can do it is you can bisect it. You can actually manipulate the growth of the agave through infrasonic waves. Uh, it doesn't work, right? That's it's something that we've done with corn. It's something we've done with squash. It's something we've done with tomatoes, and it works like a charm. It's really easy. And then agaves are kind of just like, "Fuck you, no way." Um, <laughs> and it's it's really encouraging, right? So these monocultures that we have are such high inputs of labor, right? Um, it's something that you have to spend so much money up front to get it, and in the end process, you have to spend so much money because your land is screwed too. You have high erosion rates, you have soil degradation, you're overusing your water, you're actually spraying these agaves who hate, 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 hate chemicals with chemicals. So you're putting all these costs into it that actually makes me hopeful for the fact that agaves themselves do not, even though they are super adaptable, are not best grown in these monocultures. Um, when we start to look at cultivated, wild, and then the more common semi-cultivated agaves, we actually see that if you, go, if you go to Jalisco and you look at one of those giant fields of agaves, nine times out of 10, the field is gonna have five variances of genetics in it. And I'm talking if, hectares. If that. And, if that, if, if that, that. I'm talking hectares and hectares. You go to a one hectare plot, two hectare plot um, in Oaxaca where Numerous brands, but let's use Bonhez for an example. Lu Luis Pacheco, um, one of our guys who produces really small lots for us, the Mexicano that I'm actually drinking right here, um, <laughs> all the way to liters and thousands of liters of Espadine for our ensemble, right? He does both. But when we go to his fields, what's really cool 
is he has the multiple types of corn as we talked about, but even the rows of agave, we were able to identify four to five just in the rhodocantha. He has four agaves in his fields at all, like different varietals of agave, if we will. But even with that, so let's say Angostifolia, Espidine, he has four different parents, or these seeds came from four different parents within the community. So his line of Espidine are all genetically diverse, which means that his line of Thoreal are all genetically diverse. And so all of this is to say that within one hectare you find so much diversity uh, because what's really cool is that's how many of the farmers have been taught by their father, their mother, their aunt, their uncle to farm. And it's something that's carried through to even the younger generation where Luis Pacheco's in his 50s, his dad, Donaciano's in his 80s, but his son, Luis Jr., who's 16, is able to identify the variances and the changes in the espadine. Um, and outside of them making delicious mezcal, like that to me, when you walk into someone's field and they can identify their plants so readily is so amazing and fascinating. And it does give me hope because the monoculture of agave is more represented in one spirit. When we start to look at the distillados of agave, which include mezcal, bacanora, ricea, all these things, it's only grown, right? Nine states with a denomination of origin is not a true representative of mezcal, in my opinion. Mm -hmm we are just scratching the surface. And so we have this amazing power as consumers to help push for traditional methods, which is what the vast majority of agrarian people who actually make mezcal and that large companies want. Um, you know, Bon has, the reason I work for them is that they looked at this small type of production and created a co-op to write, to kind of grow this into multiple members and nobody owns land. We're not leasing land from anybody. That's a big issue with it. But if you can take these traditional growings and you can support brands that do this, it's only going to get bigger because it's this weird thing where capitalism is happening. It sucks. It's real. There's no way around it. But what we can do is consciously affect capitalism to change it, to be what we want for the generations to come. And to me, that means demanding mezcal that is made the right way, demanding that I see it, demanding tequila that even though it has this history, you know there are people in tequila trying their best to fix it. Even the big guys, right? Even some of these big guys have amazing programs to try to correct. But what's really cool is Mezcal has the opportunity to not try to correct, but to lead, right? We as consumers have the power to buy Mezcal that uses these things and show the people who are trying to expand their brands that we want traditionally grown, we want biodiversely grown, and we wanna make sure that yes, it's environmentally sustainable, but the only way we have environmental sustainability is with economic sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so we can create this environmental sust uh, sustainability by providing the people who have the ways to kind of achieve it, economic sustainability. Yep, I, I mean, you're, you're singing my, my love right here um, <laughs> of, the whole, of the whole process. Um, but I wanna, I wanna go back um, to, to the whole agave. Um, and as you know, I said to you before we um, started broadcasting this, that I always ap approach it in telling the story of we have to look at the, the whole agave like we do with whole animal butchery um, and how it is very important to, to use as much out of the plant as possible, which culturally and historically had been the case. So, you know, it's like you were either making um, pulque or you were making mezcal but at the same time you were also eating the agave you were using the pencas in order to to strip out fibers to make rope to make bags to make clothing or you were using the pencas as roof material you know it was like the whole aspect of it and obviously global trade has um, disrupted that in a bit because it's not easy to process the fibers of the panka leaves. Um, it is laborious, it's expensive, and people stop doing it because you can get cheap plastic products. Um, you know, so how, like, if we look at it like that, what are some of the things we can do as consumers to encourage um, a, a greater use of, of the product itself, you know? Yeah, I think one thing um, is to think about composting right? Like I know this sounds super silly and kind of out of nowhere, but uh, using these parts has turned into something of composting, 
right? Where they're, the pankas are kind of left into the dirt. Re, like now, like the pankas and the heads, they're left into the dirt to kind of break down. Whereas previously, more labor would be put in to fix it. Um, so I like to think about it as composting in the way that a lot of times now we watch restaurants and they throw the whole melon rind away. They throw and they know because it's composting that it's okay. Um, but there used to be a job in kitchens where a guy would go around and collect all of the scraps off your station and make something with it, right? And I think that there needs to be a return to this ideal, right? And we're starting to see it with restaurants, right? We have amazing places that are doing that where all of a sudden, like, we look to traditions, pickled watermelon rinds, right? Amazing, but five years ago, 10 years ago, we, we didn't think it was worth it because that was trash. Uh, I think we need to start remembering that when we look back into these products, uh, these byproducts, yeah, if we're composting them, that's amazing, it's good. It kind of creates a neutral effect, but there's so much more that we could be doing with it. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite things to look at, and I, I mentioned it briefly, is the idea of biofuel, um, right? And this is, I think, a lot where these byproducts of agave come in because they can be used so much more efficiently rather than kind of turning them into th fiber. So I think that there needs to be a look into history and a reinvigoration of these kind of products. And I think tourism is the way to do that, right? These fiber products, these shoes, these belts, these ropes. Uh, someone I think in the chat just mentioned scrubbing pads, which is awesome. Um, but there's also a bunch of really cool new technologies that are looking at these byproducts from producing mezcal as well. Um, one of my favorites is kind of the bio bricks, right? I know Del McGay mm -hmm. does a lot of that. There's the guys over at Aloha Oaxaca, Aaron and Brittany, who have their own company making bioplastics out of it. Resins, this tends to come from bagazo and the post-fermentation and kind of actually even the stuff that you just scrape up these piles. Um, Sombra also has, Sombra has it. Know. Yeah, they're doing their brick project where they're building yep. the houses. That's amazing. We actually use, uh, give ours to people that want it, but a big thing that we've been using ours for is actually doing uh, filtration systems. So creating biofilters with gravel and soil and sand and things like that. And so kind of being able to clean it as it filters through. Um, it's something that we're still working on. I know there's a lot of people doing it. But a big thing is what if this, rather than these kind of tourism products was used as a true economic resource for the people? Uh, and so biofuels, are, I think are really fun. You mentioned corn, and that's actually where we get a lot of our ethanol and our biofuels from currently. Um, wheatgrass, uh, I think razor glass, grass is one of them. And it's one of these things that they are a category of plant that is yearly, right? They grow once a year, and many times they're grown in giant monocultures. And in fact, uh, they can't grow in as many regions as we think. And they're in these biofuels that we currently use. The reason that they're economically reasonable is because we farmed corn in these things in certain ways. Um, but when we break it down and look towards the future, agave and the fibers that are left behind them actually have a better financial potential and environmental potential than these one-off wheat corn and corn crops for making biofuel. Part of that is they carry so much sugar and we know how amazing they are for the potential of fermentation, right? But fermentation in Moscow is so rapid, so quick. Um, and in fact, if we, you could let it go, uh, it, but it, it, it converts sugars very efficiently, which is really cool. Um, so, sorry to interrupt, but a question around this. So when we're talking about this type of fuel making, are, are we talking about anaerobic digesters? Are we talking, uh, you know, like what, what does that kind of look like? So I think it, it, yeah, I think it's both, to be honest. It's, anaerobic, it's like anaerobic uh, respirators who are creating biofuels through energy. Those are really expensive to put in. And mm -hmm. in all honesty, the only places you see those are with rich white people. Right, like we have an amazing one here in Chicago at an amazing brewery, but guess what? <laughs> like that's where the funding comes from. So like projects like that, that's gonna be on us. That's gonna be on us as branded people. That's gonna be on us as consumers and mezcal drinkers to try to get those projects started. I think what's much more realistic is the idea is we already have bio refineries all over Oaxaca. You can see them driving around the highway. We have them here in the US, we have them throughout Mexico and they're mostly geared, uh, geared towards corn. Um, and other one yearly crops. Uh, and so I think that agave have proven that they actually have more biofuel capacity per kilo than any of these other crops. The big problem is that they take so long to grow. Um, that's the problem with making it affordable biofuel. On the mm -hmm. flip side, that's what makes it so sustainable. 
So as the demand for mezcal increases, we're going to have more pancas trimmed. We're going to have more leaves on the ground. We're going to have more of these things kind of set aside. So to me, it strikes me as why can't we take kind of this traditional idea of using these products with input to make something new, but also use some of this new technology of bio or, and these technologies that we kind of poo poo, but we need, we all need fuel to make something slightly more sustainable, slightly better, but also use that the economic profit behind it would hugely boost the communities to actually put in things like these kind of like um, to put in more solar panels to fight against like these things and actually reinvest into the environment, reinvest in their communities. So it's an interesting idea. It's just that we haven't looked deep enough into it. So even though this plant has one of the longest histories of ever like of humans using it, it doesn't necessarily have as much detail on how we can use it in the future. And, and so it's kind of sad at one point, but it's also really, really exciting. It's really, really exciting. There's so much stuff to be done with it. And so to me, it's, it, it kind of gives the idea that environmental sustainability and economic sustainability can actually become one through agave, right? Mm -hmm. Agave, mezcal is like agave, mezcal necessarily is, doesn't come from the fact that like we're not planting agaves, or we haven't planted agaves in the past to produce mezcal, right? It's always been there, it's been wild. And, uh, but we are currently planting agaves for mezcal. So why not use this as a catalyst to kind of look beyond agave, beyond mezcal for what agaves can be? Um, you know, and I think it's something that Bonhas is really lucky to be one of these people that can start to look at this, right? We have 43 plus members. The vast majority of these are actually farmers. They're not distill. They're not maestros distilling, and almost and in fact, every maestro we have distilling has fields and has land is growing their agave. So we have this huge kind of community to experiment and grow with these ideas. And we've seen like po really positive changes with how we've implemented growing, where we've taken the idea that Luis Pacheco has of planting lines of different agaves. And we've been able to spread it over hectares and hectares and hectares and hectares. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is if we as Mezcal have the power to do that with just one brand and then, you know, there's a million other brands doing that exact same thing, right? We're planting more agave, agaves than we're harvesting right now in the Mezcal world, not in the tequila world, in the Mezcal world, which is amazing. Um, if we can take that and use it to boost things, I think that the agave really is limitless in how much potential it has to help us with the effects of climate change and how we're going to adapt as humans. I mean, I, you know, I, I live in fire country in mm -hmm. California and, you know, and one of the things, you know, we have a lot of agave that grows here. Uh, mostly it's agave Americana. And there are times that I see crazy agave growing in the rocks along the, the channel in between Alameda and Oakland. Like how the hell did that get there? Um, and thank God, you know, there are agaves there because with the ships that are going through, like anything that might help capture the pollutants in the air is a fantastic thing. But, you know, looking at the power of agave, you know, number one as wind breaks in fields, if you go to Salinas and you see all of that dark soil and how that gets blown around because you just have these open fields of just lettuce and no wind breaks, you know, to kind of diminish that, that soil getting blown around, the topsoil getting blown around. Um, how agave can provide those sorts of wind breaks um, and make for natural fences. And then also, how it can be used as kind of a fire retardants um, yes. and growing, you know, growing there because they are so adaptable because they don't need a lot of water that they can grow in like crazy soil terrains or rocky terrains and they can just kind of help break that cycle. They can grow within under trees, you know, I mean, it's like the, the beauty of them. Um, so like I have this dream that the, there will be more agave replanting projects that happen I mean, in Australia. Like, Absolutely. You know, the, South Africa, I mean, South Africa, like, you know, I mean, Brazil so has been have a lot of success with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head that it's cool because we are talking a little bit about Mexico and more of the historical use, but yep. 6,000 years ago, Arizonans and Southern Californians were Meso. It was Mexico, right? Let's be honest. It was Mexico. <laughs> and those Mesoamericans and native regions were farming agave for that exact reason, right? They were using this really cool farming method called gravel rocking, where they actually pile the rocks at the base of the agave to grow and it would create natural watersheds where they could grow things. And 
it's, it's, I mean, it's something that we've done for a long time that we've kind of abandoned and it really could benefit us in these other ways, right? As utilizing them in the way that we are, even in large forms of production, right? We're there. It's, it's sad to think, but we're not going back to everything being small family farms. Um, you know, there are millions and millions of farmers in the U.S., but it's something important to remember is that 87% of farms are owned by 2% of farmers. Yeah. Um, and so as much as we want these small farmers to go back and, yeah, go to your goddamn farmer's market. Buy from your local farmers, right? If we can get one thing out of here, go do that as well. Um, it's cool because agaves and these small farmers that are succeeding more in Mexico than they are in the U.S., to be quite honest, and it's because they're using agaves. Um, one, we have mezcal down here, which is helping raise the price, but also it's helping their land be used more readily and more valuably um, than it has in the past. And I think it's something that we could integrate up here um, very, very easily. Uh, they grow everywhere and they grow well. Um, and something that you mentioned with the fire that I think is really cool, and this is just like one of my favorite facts is that an agave in a fire, like if you have a fire ravaged area, but it has agave, there's a significantly higher chance of the repopulation of wildlife into your area affected by fire if they're agave. And it's because they are so fire retardant that it provides shelter for rabbits and birds and things. Uh, in fact, in Ahutla, we have a really high population of what's called the Teotihuatlan, Teotihuatlan rabbit. It's the hare with the really long ears and the stripes. It's an endangered species. Um, and it's pretty, uh, suspected that the reason it survived so well and the reason it region it has is because it's always been filled with agave cultivars. Um, so like the fires and the farming, it provides habitat or as hunting and things like that. It's very, very cool um, because the agaves protect, add protection for all these animals. Yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, the, I, the, the study of agave is really, um, it's endless. Um, you know, we talk about more than 200 varieties. It's like there's more than 350 varieties, you know. Now, that, yeah, with the cross you know, Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy and insane. Um, and just the potential that it has um, and that we can start looking at it a different way, um, readjusting our brains so that it's like mezcal is just a byproduct of the agave rather than, you know, as you keep on saying, it is not the purpose um, of of the agave. Um, yeah. It's just one of one of those byproducts um, that happens from it. Um, that happens, you know, that the demand for it can do a lot of good when we are pursuing the correct growing practices. Um, yes. And I think that's, you know, that's always the challenge. Um, you know, one of the things with uh, where we are today with the coronavirus and um, its impact on everything is does this give us an opportunity to kind of reset things a little bit and i know when we talk about small farmers in mexico small farming here in the united states uh, you know is this an opportunity to kind of reset our approach to food systems here and you know and uh like a reset of food systems in mexico which has certainly agriculturally speaking not benefited from things like NAFTA, you know, and especially when you see the mass farms in Baja, which are basically feeding the United States, that's an environmental disaster right there um, because there's just not enough water to sustain those growing farms, et cetera, that are happening in the middle of a desert. Um, and rebuilding the milpa in, in Mexico is so important so that people can feed themselves. Um, in addition to growing all of these, you know, other types of crops. Um, before there's a, I know there's a question in there, but I have a question uh, or more of a statement. When I had the opportunity to visit Tozba in the Sierra Norte, it was really interesting how Edgar, the mescalero there, was experimenting with what crops he was growing around the agave and how that was changing the flavor itself of the agave. So that agave that was grown by the coffee trees that he had planted tasted completely different than, you know, the agave that was growing by his papaya and mango, you know, kind of trees. And, you know, so paying attention, like experimenting on that level of what it is you're growing around it, like, it has the impact on what goes into the 
the I mean, just the the pina itself long term um, yeah. as it's absorbing all of these flavors around it. But um, there's the question from Edward that's wondering um, about the different expressions uh, that Bonnez uh, sells um, and. If you can talk a little bit about um, those different expressions um, and the agaves and like what are have you ever noticed or has anyone said are there differences amongst the agave of the impact that that has on on soil or some of these environmental things that we've talked about yeah absolutely um so to kind of go to the question and then i'll try to loop it back in mm -hmm. to what you said but uh so we have a lot of expressions at bonhez and i think part of it is trying to show the diversity and increase and encourage planting diversity, harvesting diversity. Um, but most people know us from our ensemble, uh, which is our Espadine Barril, uh, sitting at 42%. It's a great cocktail mixer. Uh, it's something that we are really lucky in a Hlutla to be able to do. Um, you and I have talked about how the refrescadora um, and that type of still really allows us to create a really cool blend for people at a sustainable rate. Um, but the other expressions are all about highlighting that refrescadora, highlighting a hula, and highlighting the people in our co-op that use it. So Bonhez Mezcal, for the people watching who don't know, is comprised of 100% Oaxaqueño-owned uh, mezcal. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the brand Bonhez is not owned by anybody in the United States. In fact, the only white guy that technically works for Bonhez is me. Um, I feel very spoiled by that. I'm their token. But what it is, is that the co-op that runs and owns Bonhez, which is called Upatic, actually is certified nonprofit. So each member of the co-op actually owns a portion of the co-op, and that's how they're paid. Um, and the big focus of Bonhez is on the community of Ohutla. And so we have our ensemble, which utilizes everybody in the co-op to make. But then we also have these single expressions, which are, um, I'll go down, we have Quiche, Arqueño, um, Tobala, Tepastate, Mexicano, Jabalí, and a Pachuga. And so we always offer these seven because these are the most common that we've been able to find in our community. And what we do is we actually release these. So they have a label like this that tells you what it is. And then more importantly, it has a label on the back like this. And so this highlights the maestro. So this one is a quiz from the Nacional Pacheco, who is uh, from La Noria, Sección Tracer in Ahutla. Um, and so this is an Agave Karwinski, a quiche, quiche, um, as we were talking a little bit earlier, there's probably, a, in my opinion, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of Karwinskis out there um, that have kind of variants. Um, and then it kind of goes through all the details, but each one of these is a small lot production that we bottle and sell um, that is only one maestro. Uh, and we, and rather than offering the quiche that's just by the Nasiano, we offer a quiche and we can change out that back label depending on which maestro has some. That way we're not pushing them to over harvest, harvest agaves that aren't mature, harvest them aren't right. And for me as a mezcal nerd, it kind of gets to help select some of these with, uh, this is all about the refrescadora type still and the soil and climate and community of Ahutla. Um, the type of mezcal there has a really unique and distinct flavor. It has its own regional history and Banhas is really about exploring and explaining that. Um, the reason I said I'd tie it back on is because uh, the question also asked me like, what is one of my favorite expressions? Uh, and it's it's hard to say because each agave really acts as somewhat of a bioindicator, right? Uh, it tells you a lot about the environment it's been in. Um, and bioindicators act in lots of different ways. In the rainforest, it's a specifically certain types of dart frogs, right? If they're present, you know that there's enough green because the humidity is correct, the rainfall is correct. Um, the environment is acting in a way that these frogs will want to be here. Uh, coyotes uh, is the kind of the same thing in more Midwestern states, right? If you have coyotes in woods, lots of people are like, oh, those are bad, but actually it's really good. It means that there's a healthy predator prey activity in your fields and things like that. And for me, an agave and flavor is a bioindicator because it tells you what's happening in that region. Um, so for example, I am drinking this Mexicano which is semi-cultivated. So it was a agave that was found in the wild. The seeds were brought back down um, into the palenque and then replanted in a, in, um, into the fields. Uh, and for me, I'm getting to taste all sorts of minerality in this expression. I find it to be really kind of um, towards that wet stone clay. And so then when we talked to Luis Pacheco, who makes this one, and we went out to his fields, what we saw is 
a high amount of clay in the soil. It's really dark and damp. Um, there's not much sugar production because it doesn't have a lot of organic matter in the soil. You're getting more kind of like lower sugar production. And then another thing to note is that his fields particularly have a lot of goat and sheep activity, primarily goats, a few cows, but lots and lots of goats whose shit happen to be full of nitrogen, tons and tons of nitrogen. And so when I taste this, I get notes of lime peel, kind of like a mango pickle, if you will, like that lime mango pickle. And I know from this agave and the flavor of it that that is indicating that the soil had a crap ton of nitrogen, nitrogen in it, pun intended. Um, and so it was <laughs> filled with like all this goat shit. Uh, and so I love agaves that really uh, um, kind of pop and like give you these flavors because they tell you a story of the land. Uh, and so Mexicano personally is my one of my favorites. Uh, I always lean to it because it's fairly new in our community. Uh, Ahutla had a really long history of having Mexicano, but um, as we've seen with tequila a lot of times, especially in the 90s, mm -hmm. a lot of agave in Oaxaca was really wiped out early, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Mexicano and Ahutla being one of those because it's so sugar heavy, it's really great for making tequila. Um, and so Luis Pacheco really wanted to bring these back. Uh, and so we went and found them and brought them. And so the bottles that we have in the United States of this Mexicano right now, um, we're really excited because they're an agave that was there, has gone down, but through the proper farming and through the, the idea that agave can kind of act as awesome ways to boost the environment and boost cultural traditions around the environment. We've like, Luis has managed to bring back the Mexicano pass along the seeds to three other maestros. So Luis's Mexicano is not the only expression of Mexicano and Banjas that you'll see in the future. And that's something that's really exciting. Interesting. And Edward had a question of, do you guys have a coyote? Or... Yeah. Um, so coyote uh, is actually endemic to Sol de Vega, who in a, are our neighbors in Ahutla, just up the hill. Shout out to Ramses and Roman Raul, who own uh, La Carencia in um, Oaxaca. If you haven't met those guys and you want to learn about Coyote or Sol de Vega, go there. Um, but what's cool is similar to the Mexicano, there was a small amount of Coyote at Ahutla, but it, it was bought out and never really returned because most things were replaced with Espedi or Barril in Ahutla's case. Um, but what's really fun is Luis Pacheco, who again is like leading this charge. Uh, he is our biggest agave nerd and like probably one of my favorite tios. Uh, he has recently worked his magic and traded some barril, uh, which is our indigenous to Ahutla, to a guy in Sol de la Vega for some seedlings of coyote. And we have our first kind of like lines and um, fields of coyote. They're in their fifth and sixth years, respectively. So not yet, but hopefully in the future when they're ready. <laughs> um, and that's really exciting. Yep. Um, let's see. See. A new expression, mierda de cabra. <laughs> oh yeah. All about that chivo um, shit. Yep. Um, well, I mean, I think now is a, a good time to kind of open this up to other questions that, that people might have or thoughts. I know that there were some questions coming in about what other brands are, are doing programs like Banez or focused on um, the planting side of it. And I, I think that um a lot um yeah. have been a lot you know because in reality everybody understands that this is the future um of if they're going to have a sustainable market sustainable in the sense that they will be able to make mezcal um they need to have the variety of agave that's out there um so it is more often than not that you see brands working with the magalleros the agaveros to ensure that stuff is getting planted, um, that it's being planted in a variety of ways. So it's not just via Hijuelo, that there's doing a mix with seeds and other types of cultivation, which is really important. Yeah, um, just off the top of my head, a few of the guys that I've been lucky enough to work in Oaxaca that I think do a great job, like Gabe at Del Maguey, hands down, amazing at what he does. Um, I think that Jason at Cinco is really focused on this and as well. Um, you've got El Bujo killing it. And of course, um, El Vago, Vago is one of the few, like one of the people that really, for me, inspired me to look at agaves in this way. I mean, and, and that's just a quick, you know, top four list of people that are really doing a good job 
you see people like Somra and oh, there's so many, right? There's it's right, a yeah. huge list, but um, I can say that um, also Alipus, um, the guys over there are in Desantes and the Mescalero collection. Um, you know, Sven is doing an amazing job of replanting agaves and focusing on this. I mean, you yeah. can't like every every person. If you're into the, the thing I love about mezcal is mezcal fans come from people who love tequila and love sustainability. There's, you know, this is, that's, that's where we've come from, I think. And for me, that's the perfect kind of mix for how we're going to blow up agave into being something that's not, it's not going to fix our issues with sustainability, but it's going to be one step forward to us creating something that's good for Isaiah, your son, that's good, good for his kids, right? Down the line. Yep. Um, a question from uh, Katarina that is, um, do we see, you know, apart from mescaleros and brands, um, do we see kind of a, a public private sustainability industry emerging like through research institutes um, or environmental firms uh, in Oaxaca uh, working around this issue of agave cultivation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's really exciting how they're utilizing agave and mezcal. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of amazing programs right now. I'm working to get our mezcal bat safe certified, right? Um, which is, which is a project in itself that is using agave to help endangered species. Um, there is also like we mentioned Guerrero, um, but that is actually the some of the studies were done on a reforestation program that's actually through government subsidies but run by the Iruecos, the communal, the communal groups. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's run through them, but subsidized by the government. Um, and I know a lot of the grant writing is from organizations. Um, there's even Organizado de Medio Ambiente Guerrero. That's like, right? It's the Organization of Environment for Guerrero, which is an amazing thing to think of. But um, yeah, there's, tiny, there's tons and tons of great ones. Seconda, from, uh, who Lou at Sacred Agave works with, they do great work. Um, I mean, there is a bunch of bunch of programs for replanting, but I think one of my favorite things is that um, we have academics doing it, and that's amazing. But the bigger picture is that the communities are doing it themselves. Um, Agua del Espino, for example, you had lunch out there with that community mm -hmm. uh, three times a year. Three times a year, they do different plantings. So they do an agave replanting, they do a tree replanting, and then they do a wildflower, like traditional wildflowers and herb replanting. And so. They vary it with the different rains, um, but three different times every year, that community, and that's just one community in Ahula does that. And it's right. something that they've done for generations. I mean, I think that if there's definitely something to be learned from communities in Oaxaca is that oftentimes we're used to outside organizations coming in and saying, oh, well, this is what you should do. And actually within those communities, because there's been the tradition of agave farming and production for so long, um, that there are inherent learned knowledge aspects of it that really, you know, like you almost need that first grounds up kind of people from the community, lots of investment going there of, oh, what have you found that works that doesn't work? Um, because it would save a lot of time in the end of putting together programs on a larger scale that, you know, actually work more. Um, I, you know, like for me, there's the great, there was the great project to put um, gas stoves into the kitchens in communities. And for, for people who haven't um, been in Oaxaca or traveled much in Mexico, um, cooking in kitchens with live fire is, is so part of the culture. Um, and so you see the kamals and everything like that. It also creates longer term respiratory issues when you have the families and the kids, women and children primarily, spending so much time around these fires. So there was this great idea of, we're gonna bring in these gas stoves um, that people can have so we can reduce this issue. And, and it was just like that culturally did not work um, because that is not the relationship that people have with cooking or how you do cooking. So it's like, how instead do you work on a ventilation system rather than changing the cooking method itself? Yeah, I mean, and that's a big thing. Um, I found, you know, I'm a white guy, right? Like, let's, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, that's exactly what I am. And if I were to go and talk about soil and talk about some of these types of farming that would benefit them, it would never work. 
And for good reason, because like, why the hell should some kid from the United States tell you how to use your land? And in much sense, it's true, right? The Zapotec have some of the oil, oldest soil taxonomies out there. But what, we, but what you're saying is true, right? There are certain things of these cultures that are beneficial and not beneficial. Um, but the way that we at Bond has have kind of found the way to make this work is finding professors, finding people and leaders in the community that look like the members of our community that speak and sound like the community, the members of our community, because they are. Um, and to me that, uh, like, it's going to be, uh, like, um, it's, it's hard to do because a lot of people are hesitant, but it's, it's the future of it is to say like, Hey, I'm here on the side, right? Like I'm here on the side. If you have questions, you need my help. That's what I'm here for. But like, here is your community member. And here's what they think will work because that's where you get structural ideas that actually make change. Um, I mean, like, that's how we got bond has to work as a co-op, right? It's not like a white guy came in and said, your prices have to be low. It's a, it was like, okay, the co-op came together and their idea was, okay, how can we work together to create something that's a price that will sell decently, will be sustainable enough that we can make a lot of it. Um, and then how do we like maintain our quality? And the, the thing was to work together and to talk together. And then the only reason that happened is because Francisco, who opened the co-op, co looks like them. He's from Ahula, he talks like them. You know, he was the mayor. Like, the only reason it worked is because it wasn't someone like me coming in and telling him to do it. Yep. Um, we have a, it's a, a comment question um, from Jonathan that, you know, is really talking about the differences of so many alcohols are made from grains. Um, and that they're one season crops. Um, with agave, you have mul it's multi-season. So you're talking minimum six, seven years that it's growing and collecting those sugars. Um, and so the question statement, it's, it's more sophisticated botanically speaking and, you know, and therefore more sophisticated in the ultimate flavor um, just from the essence of the plant alone. So question statements do you have thoughts on that or yes right like that's in my, <laughs> in my opinion it's true um but i don't think that it degrades because like you know corn is a really interesting product too and the whiskey that comes from it um and the products that come from it outside of just whiskey like are amazing um but yeah right the complexity of agave is one aspect that makes it so complex in its tasting but i think part of that is broken down into yes it takes years and years to grow and so those sugars are really really structured right um they come into fructans is what we call them and that's most of the complex sugars we have other sugars within the agave that are formed and uh, essentially through the biosynthesis produced and they're held in different things um and so the sugars in corn are so much more accessible that it takes less of a process to extract them, right? To get them malleable to create a spirit. And because it takes less input, I think the output has less complexity because there's not as much put in. That's not to say that it's not complex and interesting. It's just a part of the process. Um, something to think about is there's seven to, there's seven natural yeasts and 13 microbes active at any, like throughout the entire process of fermentation for agave and that's on a short six to seven day fermentation of espadine, right? Mm -hmm. As you add more agave or you change these different, you change periods, these all, all these things, different change. Um, and even what's really cool is that corn is not, it. you add the yeast in, so you're specifically controlling the strain. Uh, one of my favorite strains of yeast is called Marxianus. It's only found in Palancas in Mexico and it's because of like the wild animals there and it's, only, and it's really tolerable to high heats, but it gives us like pineapple conagers and all these different things. And so we have aspects of the fermentation and process in mezcal, in tequila, in raicilla, in bacanora that mm -hmm. don't exist. And so the complexity that comes from them literally cannot be put into whiskey. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's, uh, it is kind of, you know, my, my own bias against corn, and which is why I've been so interested in the corn whiskeys that are coming out of Mexico now, um, is that they're drawing from a more diverse uh, corn base than oftentimes what you find with corn whiskeys in the United States, which um, 
you know, there isn't the same kind of focus on heirloom corn varieties. We've, we've kind of bred that out. <laughs> As a former like Midwestern whiskey guy, I gotta say, actually there, uh, I have right now in my house, I have a Johnny red uh, or like a, not a Johnny rocker red, like the Johnny red corn, a whiskey. Oh, made from that. okay. Got it made from that. I have a green Oaxacan corn one. I have a rainbow corn one. Um, and that's all from one local distillery that's an hour and a half away from me. Right. And so I think there is complexity to be found. Um, it's just not as ubiquitous um, mm -hmm. because we have a heritage of using similar, simpler things. So yeah. yeah. Um, to That's answer cool. his statement, I would say, do a little more digging, right? You'll find something. <laughs> yep. All right. Do we have any other questions here for, for Alex? Um, on, it's a lot to absorb, you know, yeah. it's like, and this is always the thing that I find after talking to you, my brain buzzes, you know, where it's just like, huh, okay. Um, so maybe I might have to go down the rabbit hole of small local distilleries in the Midwest and their corn whiskeys. Absolutely. The, or rye. You might go even crazy. Or rye, yeah. Um, rye is one of my favorites. I have seven, seven varietals of different rye. That's all from one farm right now that yeah. were made into rye. Like it, it gets wild. You can find the things that we love about mezcal, the things that we love about agave and sustainability in agave and mezcal and how it connects, can you and I have talked about this, we can yeah. fi you can find it anywhere. Yeah. I didn't start in mezcal, I started in cheese, right? How did I get to mezcal? Who the fuck knows? Right. It's all yeah. because it's interconnected and we, <laughs> we love these things. So this True. before you, yeah, before you think something is more simple, right? Like mm -hmm. there's a very good chance that the process is, yes, but the history and you can always find someone doing it super weird and complex. Um, just make friends with them because it's probably expensive. Oh, it's very true. Um, so uh, Gabriel is wondering if we can see your bunny. Oh, yes. And Bradley I say yes, to... yes, yes. We want to see second. the bunny. Um, thank you, Gabriel, for bringing oh, that up. Um, but now we, we'll see the angry bunny. Um, I know I, I thank you all for for participating in this. Um, I I can spend hours talking to Alex um, about all of this and more and oh cutie. <laughs> this is Bradley. Does Bradley have anything to say to us? <laughs> um, well, just so you know, Bradley does practice dark magic, so be careful. Um, okay. Yes, but Gabriel. You are just as cute as Bradley. I love you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah. All right, B, I'll let you down. Go. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Um, I will be sending out the link to this uh, at the end of the week. On Wednesday, we have a great uh, talk lined up with John Gertzen of ABV Bar in San Francisco and his wife, Callie Gold, who is with Beretta. Um, and it's, it'll, uh, two and a half months, um, stuck together, uh, in a house as a married couple, um, and bartenders, we're going to be diving into kind of the experience around that, um, and seeing what they've been up to, um, uh, during that time when it comes to thinking cocktails or bar programs or anything. Um, so that's five o'clock on Wednesday, five o'clock PST. Uh, and then I will be sending out the information um, this, uh, this week in our newsletter about our June program. And I will just, you know, like seed it by saying, we're going to have a very interesting conversation about sustainability with a, an aforementioned large tequila brand, um, as well as uh, another, as a brand of Mescal, kind of talking about their initiatives. So that will be interesting, but you have to wait until the newsletter to see what it is we're doing. Um, but uh, Alex, again, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. And thank you all. And we will be back Wednesday. Yeah. Right? Thanks, Susan. Bye, guys. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye.